Uh, hello there and welcome back to our lecture series. I'm Ted, your host, and uh, for, for this lecture we're going to continue right along with our examination of African history. Um, and uh, to begin with, let me uh, jump right into our narrative, right into our discussion. Um, for our discussion, uh, we're going to uh, begin by focusing in on, on focusing in on Aksumite trade. Now, as I stated in our last lecture, Aksum was located at a critical junction uh, between the African, the Mediterranean, the Near Eastern, the Chinese, and the Indian trade routes. Um, uh, the Red Sea had always been an important area for shipping, and Axum sort of uh, takes full advantage of this. Um, all of the processes, all of the processes and the events um, of, uh, of the development that we looked at in our last lecture, and all of the processes and developments in Axum in particular during the, uh, the, uh, the third and the fourth centuries uh, of the Common Era, they all came together. Uh, Christianity tied Axum into the deep cultural and political networks of exchange um, of the greater cities of the Mediterranean. Uh, these would be the cities of Rome, Alexandria, Constantinople, and Antioch. Uh, and Christianity would act as an extremely important unifying force in Ethiopia for the next 1600 years. Um, literally up to the present. Um, and, and later it was served as, uh, as um, the motivating factor for the isolation of Ethiopia as the Islamic conquest and the trade restrictions uh, pushed uh, the Ethiopians further, further inland um, put, and it really just pushed in from all sides. Now coinage, minting their own coins, uh, made the internal workings of the state more steady. Uh, the port of Adulis um, made the products of the African interior, uh, products such as ivory, gold, the agricultural crops, and slaves. Um, uh, the, the port of Adulis made sure that all of these goods uh, and commodities uh, made their way to all the major trade centers. Um, the profits generated through this exchange made Axum extremely rich and extremely powerful. By the 6th and 7th century, um, there were significant population identities with increased social differenti uh, differences between them. Um, this is evidenced again by grave goods, by palaces, and by steles. Um, and, and steles, like Egyptian obelisk, uh, and there is some debate over whether the Egyptian obelisk was uh, was a, uh, was an influence on the Ethiopian stele, was many holding that it was. Um, they were carved from a single piece of stone. Um, they were not cobbled. Uh, they, they were simply um, carved from one single piece of stone and then erected. Now, terrace ag agriculture and new plowing also lead to an increase in uh, agricultural productivity in Axum. There is evidence of erosion at many of the Axumite sites as well, which hints at the unstable long-term sustainment of many sites. Now, the Axumites ruled much of the Ethiopian plateau until the 8th century. Uh, the last two centuries of Axum were a period of steady decline, as trade routes and trade opportunities were lost due to the rise of Islam. Um, they were also lost, uh, and it was also um, uh, uh, a lot of turmoil because of the many wars that would um, that that would ensue uh, due to the Islamic conquerors, uh, the, the the recent uh, Islamic converts. Uh, attempted to conquer Axum and attempted to push in and spread Islam. Now, Axum grew weak due to the loss of the trade wealth, um, it, and it weakened its control over the outlying regions, and it shifted the population and the political gravity of Axum into the Ethiopian highlands. Now, at the crossroads of two continents, um, prosperity was tied to the exchange networks and as soon as Axum began to lose access to those trade networks she began to, uh, to fall in, in standing in the region. Now uh, now that we've uh, examined East Africa I like to sort of transition um, uh, westward and we'll look at the inland uh, Niger region uh, and then this is literally on the other end of the African continent uh, around the bulge of Africa, inland, uh, towards the, uh, inland, um, into the uh, the bulge of Africa, along the Nile, not the Nile, the Niger River Delta. Now, um, 
the woodlands, the, the wooded grasslands of Central Africa extend for a distance of some uh, 5,000 miles. And that is a vast difference. Um, and, and this environment uh, fostered population organization and exchange. On the, uh, on the western edge of this zone uh, lays the inland Niger Delta, an environmentally extraordinary area where the Niger River expands uh, outwards to a complex network of rivers, streams, and of course marshes. Um, in this area, in, in this region, there is significant agricultural production uh, opportunities. Um, there, there is also, uh, this is also an area where significant cultural and economic activity would develop. Uh, from very early on, regional trade routes and other exchange systems develop and flourish in this region. For centuries, the, this area was one of the wealthiest in Africa. It was a source of trade goods that were in great demand globally. This area was an important agricultural center, but also occupied an area where the control of the trade routes extended from the tropical forests and the coastal ports um, uh, of the coastal port cities of North Africa. Now, the populations living in this area were perfectly situated to exploit the resources um, and, the, uh, and the abundant potential of the very different neighboring regions. Now, today, this region is among the most impoverished regions in Africa and among the most impoverished regions in the world. Uh, and this stemmed primarily from the loss of the control of the trans-Saharan trade routes, um, first to the Arabs in the north, uh, in, in North Africa, and then later to European traders who created trade networks along the coast, uh, along the bulge of Africa after uh, 1500. Now, there are two terms used when describing this region, Sahel and Sudan. Uh, both are, are Arabic words uh, brought in during and after the Islamic conquest of, of North Africa. Um, the Sahel refers to the semi-arid zones that directly border the deserts of North Africa. Now, the meaning of Sahel is coast, and in Arabic, um, it is used to refer to the Sahel being uh, an end to the ocean of sand, uh, that, that is the great North African desert. Um, from the 16th century onwards, European traders increasingly used sea routes to gain access to the wealth of the tropical regions of the bulge of Africa, and this diverted the trade activities of the region, which increasingly impoverished uh, the people living in the Sahel. Now, the, the formerly productive urban centers became increasingly isolated and marginal economic backwaters. Uh, now, the urban centers and states of West Africa have traditionally been described or presented as the result of contact with North African states uh, who are members of the Mediterranean Sea Trade Network. Um, they are also assumed to be relatively late, and, and this went along again with the earlier 19th century assumption that Africa had no history before the arrival of the European or the arrival of the Arab. Now, historians of that era and a few today ascribe the rise of urbanism, wealth, and state formation to the introduction of Islam um, and the arrival of the Arabs in the north, in North Africa. Now, social and political complexities predate the rise of Islam in West Africa. It predates the, the rise of Islam in general. Um, archaeology in recent years have largely debunked the myth that African civilization, African organization arose due to contact with outside influences. Um, we, we, uh, we, we see the findings of urban centers and cultural materials of larger states. We, we find these at these archaeological sites. We also know that trans-Saharan trade prospered long before the arrival of the Arabs. Uh, the camel, for example, was introduced by the Romans to facilitate trade between Roman North Africa and the Niger uh, River Delta um, trade routes in West Africa. We also know that the ancient Carthaginians fostered trade relations with the states and the economic centers along the Niger Delta from uh, the early times of their history of their organization. Um, so uh, so we're, we're jumping back uh, seven, uh, at least 800 years before um, the rise of, well, not even 800, it's, it's 1,000 to 800 years before the rise of Islam, 
we can see trade networks, we can see um, urbanism, we can see organized states in this region uh, due, due to the trade activity. Uh, now, the Niger River Delta developed somewhat like the civilization in ancient Egypt in the backdrop of an encroaching and unforgiving desert where pastoral grasslands once supported cattle herds, uh, hunting and gathering groups, uh, living along the rivers and lake systems that are now deserts. Uh, and, and what is now uh, the southern stretches of the North African desert, herding communities that also cultivated millet developed. Uh, they, they, they developed there and they also developed networks of exchange and constructed burial mounds for local elites. And we find evidence of this as early as uh, the 4th millennium BCE, um, implying a dynamic towards greater social, uh, social sophistication at, at, at this early, early date. In the region of, the, of, uh, of southern Mauritania, a region that has been largely overtaken by the desert, archaeologists have found over 90 sites that were occupied between 1500 and 500 BCE. The layout of these, settle, of these settlements suggests a very uh, early level of political sophistication. Uh, due to desertification, um, the region, um, which was once uh, which was once a, a bustling, uh, dense urban center, um, due to uh, the desertification of the region, um, the, these and and the uh, accompanying significant environmental stresses that were placed on the region, uh, the settlements were abandoned and populations drifted further south. Uh, now, the population centers uh, there um, cultivated what, what we know as, what we know as African millet. Um, and that was somehow exchanged along these very, very early uh, trade routes because we find African millet in the uh, in this river valley. We find it at in this river valley sites. Now we know that millet originated in West Africa because the wild ancestor of the crop still exists in West Africa today. Uh, it is likely that some form of a territorial entity existed, some state or, or city or, or culture existed and participated in a vast early exchange system that facilitated the movement of goods in the third millennium BCE. That is, there was some trade network in which West African mullet was exchanged either along um, a, uh, a, a, an east, uh, a west to east trade route that sent Af uh, West African products east into the Nile River Valley or a north-south trade route that sent West African goods from the Niger River Delta, the inland Niger River Delta, to the uh, the coast of West uh, North Africa, um, and, and that these goods were then exchanged somewhere along Mesopotamia, either along the Levantine shore, or along the Red Sea, or uh, along the Persian Gulf, um, with states in Mesopotamia, uh, and these states in Mesopotamia then exchanged it um, along the uh, trade routes extending along the Persian Gulf or through the Iranian Plateau to its final destination, what would be uh, settlements in the Indus River Valley. Um, we, we know that that had to have existed because African millet uh, from the third millennium is in uh, is in Indus River Valley sites. So uh, some sort of, ex of a trade route had to exist and these people had to be participating in it and at the very least it would have been overseen by some sort of territorial entity either a kingdom um, uh, uh, a league of cities uh, a union of cities or just one single um, urban territorial center or urban territorial state um, Now, uh, at the same time that the uh, that these that these sites were developing, uh, and, and that they were also facing increasing desertification. Now, the areas to the south uh, were wet. Uh, further south, they were still wet, and they were able to sustain substantial agriculture, uh, much like how the Nile River Valley was too wet to facilitate agriculture. Um, or, or sediment in, uh, in, 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 uh, in really large numbers, the, uh, the Niger Delta region was the same way until uh, desertification had passed. Um, the inland Niger Delta, it really does appear to be just um, uh, too swampy until the, um, uh, 
uh, too swampy um, to occupy until the end of the first millennium BCE. Uh, had the site dried out, the local population were forced to migrate um, out uh, and to the inland Niger Delta, uh, where they began to uh, cultivate cereals, um, and, and, and which were really becoming more of their staple crops. Um, they, they arrived and most likely interacted with the indigenous populations who practiced farming and gathering. Uh, at, at an important development, uh, at, at an important period, uh, the development of this period was the introduction of indigenous African rice, a different species of rice from Asian rice which was domesticated independently in West Africa and supported the population in and around the inland Niger Delta. Now, the introduction of rice greatly increased the agricultural potential of the region. Uh, settlement development in the inland uh, Niger Delta began fairly quickly in the first millennium BCE, with farming communities appearing at Jiao um, in the 8th uh, century BCE, um, Jenny Jano uh, began in the latter half of the first millennium BCE uh, and complex networks of prospering towns began to appear throughout the region uh, by the second century that, that it, it is dotted with prospering towns uh, and there is a substantial population increase in this region um, during this period. Now trade was a vital necessity in this region uh, from the very beginning at Jenny Jano for example iron or um, along with stone and copper were major items that were sought. Um, the, these resources were all imported, possibly using the Niger Delta. Uh, the Niger River has a transportation highway, but they were all imported from faraway locations. Um, later, gold. Gold would develop as an extremely valuable trade resource and would dominate for centuries to come the economic life of, uh, of uh, the, the inland Niger Delta. Um, cola nuts, uh, meat products, um, salt from the desert zones, all of these goods would uh, come to, uh, to play a significant role in the, um, in the formation of states and organization of states in this region. Um, Jenny Jano and Zhao would develop as major economic sites for the exchange of goods in this region. And what is now Burkina Faso? Archaeology has only recently began and in the last two decades we find that sites dating to the early first millennium at KC3 uh, we find a high status graves from 400 to 700 with brass and copper anklets. Uh, we find cowrie shells. Um, we find glass and carnelian beads. We find weapons like swords and these swords are coming from southern and northern African regions. Um, some of these beads appear to be of a design from the Indus River Valley. The appearance of cowrie shells and the beads, they do, they do hint at the uh, sustained contact between West Africa, the inland Niger Delta region, and uh, the Indus region. Now, these artifacts highlight access to long distance trade goods that are, that are coming through through the major urban centers um, along all of the civilizations that we have been discussing throughout our course throughout our, 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 our discourse. Now, uh, from, the, from the Indus Valley, um, we, we, we see that, uh, uh, we, we, we also see that, um, that, these, uh, that the cowrie shell and the significance of the cowrie shell and the beads had significant um, prestige items because they're not produced locally um, also rise. Um, and, and this will be uh, another, um, the, those two artifacts would also be examined when we look at uh, East African civilizations um, and how uh, prestige goods that are not local are sought out. Um, now these grave goods belong to, uh, that, that, that I spoke of, um, the, uh, the grave goods from East Africa, they belong to a horse riding elite group. Um, and at Cassie 3 we find regional cultural um, attributes that are similar to those of the inland Niger Delta. Um, by the mid first millennium at Jenny Jano, um, what we find, uh, what we find is that Jenny Jano by the mid first millennium was an important urban center capable of housing some 20 to 30,000 inhabitants. Uh, these people lived in urban clusters. Um, th and this pattern of clustering population is fairly common practice. Uh, 
um, to, to civilizations and to states in the inland Niger Delta. Um, there was also a very well-established hierarchy of settlements which develop along indigenous line, uh, lines. There is also um, not a lot of indication that there was a great difference in, in, uh, in, in standing or material wealth within these communities. Uh, we find no palaces or administrative centers at Jani Jano. Um, the grave goods also display very few differences in the material wealth at Jani Jano. Um, and, and this really suggests that a, uh, a hierarchical organization as opposed to a hierarchical organization uh, was in place in, the, in these cities. Um, they may have been governed by ethnic or occupational councils rather than a strong man or an elite class. Um, archaeology at Jani Jano suggests a differentiation along ethnic lines and occupation lines. Uh, now, we cannot assume that hierarchy did not exist in these cities, uh, but, but we must acknowledge that, um, that, that there may have been just simply uh, different logics of governing that existed in these cities. Um, there seems to be considerable variation among towns and political systems. Um, we also do not have any evidence of a large territorial state at this time. Now, the settlements at this time appear to be independent city-states. Um, we also find that through archaeology, there is a high degree of urbanism, uh, similarity in pottery, terracotta figurines, um, and all of these are, fine, uh, are found throughout the region, and they highlight a wide cultural contact. Um, they, 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 they hint at a, a wide cultural sort of overlay or background in this region, a unifying culture in this region. Um, and it also hints at a more complex civilization um, in this region, a more complex atmosphere that is distinct to West Africa. Now, later Islamic and Arab travelers, they were shocked when they got there and they saw the degree of sophistication and cultural divergence within West Africa, um, which, which would have been unlikely if the region had developed along similar North African or later Islamic influences. Now, we know that the inland Niger centers were the linchpin in the trans-Saharan trade, um, the, the, uh, the trans-Saharan trade that from antiquity was rooted on the movement of gold, uh, on the gold trade, and that would expand to the slave trade and the ivory trade. Uh, we also know that other goods were, were uh, exported to this region. Um, horses, uh, salt, um, a host of manufactured goods. We know that Jani Jano began to decline in the second millennium. Uh, and, and we have evidence of a defensive wall being put into place, um, which, which would not have existed um, before... Uh, um, which would not have existed before um, the arrival of a uh, stronger um, and, and more uh, long-term sustained political contact with North Africa. Now, the site was abandoned by 1400, and by this time, West Africa had long been under uh, the influence of expansive militaristic states. And I'm, and I'm, in particular, I'm, I'm speaking of the expansive uh, militaristic states of our car, uh, frequently um, mis, um, misidentified as Ghana. Um, Ghana was the title of the ruler. Uh, it meant warrior king. It did not reply or, or refer to the state. Uh, the state was our car. Um, and also Mali and of course the Songhai. Uh, and those three empires will come to dominate uh, the history of West Africa through the first half of the second millennium. And we will get to them at a later date. Um, but after now, hit like, subscribe, and comment. Let me know what you thought about this, uh, this lecture on the development of uh, states along um, the, uh, the inland Niger Delta region. Uh, it is still a very, it's a very rich and vibrant region. Um, it still is. It was, it was especially then, uh, especially so back then. It is still a very um, wealthy region for, in terms of natural resources. Uh, trade routes and trade prices are, are really, um, we really played a key role in their decline. Uh, but as always, hit like, subscribe, and comment. Let me let me know what you thought about this lecture. And as always, I am Ted, and I'll see you guys next time for another lecture as we continue our discourse on African history.